This is Duke University. Uh, my name is Frederick Soa, and I am the outgoing co-president of the Business in Africa Club here at uh, Fuqua, and also the, uh, the vice chairman of, uh, of this 2015 Duke MBA Business in Africa Conference. Um, thank you very much for being here this morning. Um, now, the conference is brought to you by the Fuqua Business in Africa Club, and uh, we were founded in 2011. We are very young organization entirely run by um, students. And you know we've been working very tirelessly since last summer um, to bring you this event. So we hope you are as excited as we are today um, to really to uh, enjoy this event um, that is full of people who are very passionate about making a difference um, in Africa through business and enterprise. Um, this conference will not be possible without our uh, general sponsor. So I'd like to take a moment to recognize our diamond sponsors, uh, Muchcom Group Limited, based in Accra, Ghana, and the Duke University Graduate and Professional Student Council, Gypsy. I would also like to thank uh, IBM for its uh, continued support to the club over the past uh, few years. We also want to say a big thank you to uh, the panelists and the speakers who've traveled from near and wide, um, both inside and outside the US, to be here uh, this morning. Um, the theme for the conference is uh, fostering innovation ecosystems in Africa. And we chose it because we wanted to recognize the important role that um, innovation plays in pretty much um, unlocking the numerous opportunities that abound in our homeland, um, Africa. And uh, it is our hope, and in fact, it's our challenge to each and every one of us here today um, to use this conference to find at least one answer to the question, how can I contribute to promoting innovation on the business landscape in Africa? At this point, I would like to uh, uh, introduce one of the most uh, uh, beloved figures here at, uh, at Fuqua. Uh, he's a, uh, the dean of the daytime um, MBA program and the MMS program. And since the club's inception in 2011, um, Dean Ross Morgan has been very, very supportive and of all the club's ambitions. So whether through the Dean's office or through uh, the MBA association, he's always been there for us. So without further ado, I'd like to invite Ross to say a few words uh, of welcome. Thank you very much. Welcome, everybody. I think people are going to be in and out of here all day, but um, thanks, first of all. There's some great panelists that, that are here, and as Freddie said, some people have come from, from quite far away to be here to help us, and um, I, I want to thank them because they've given a lot of their time um, to get here. So. Also, thanks to the club. As Freddie said, this is a really young club, and so I was associate dean when this club was formed, and you'll hear from um, some people. We have some alums who are back who actually helped form this club, so they'll be speaking on some of the panels today. But the thing that really impresses me is what this club has been able to do in such a short amount of time. And so when you look at some of the young clubs, it's really hard for them to get some traction from the beginning. I think this club has done a great job. The conferences they've had over the last few years have been terrific. And part of that to me is when students look at their experience when they come here, they say, you know, what, what can I get out of my pupil experience? is I think some students recognize that they had an, an, an opportunity here. We had a void here. And so part of that void is being filled by what the club is doing and then what, what's going to happen here today. So, um, from a bigger perspective, um, for those of you that are connected to, to Fuqua, I think if you've looked or been here over the last 10 years or so, you've seen what our positioning is. And so this, this global connectedness, being embedded and connected is a phrase that, that you hear and you see in terms of our positioning, whether it's a website or, or conversations that we have. And so um, when I look at Africa, we, we've made great strides to be connected in Africa. And most of that is through South Africa at this point, but there, there are discussions, and we're starting to get up alumni who are, are, are elsewhere in the continent. So you know, when you look at, um, at Duke Corporate Education, I know Jay Kaiser will be here today as one of the panelists. So Duke Corporate Education is the, is the non-degree executive education part of, of, of what we do, um, especially on custom education. So we have an office in Johannesburg. 
Uh, I know a number of you have gone on GATE and recently come back from GATE um, in, in South Africa. So from the very beginning, our academic travel experiences have gone to South Africa. We've had that connection. Um, some of you have been involved in consulting practicums. And so the consulting practicum side of this, um, we're heavily engaged in South Africa from the very beginning. And that actually laid the foundation for our international practicum. And then, um, are, are you guys familiar with people around the world? I hope, I hope our current uh, <laughs> students are. Um, so tonight, um, Fuqua is engaging in um, a worldwide connection activity. So our alums, uh, prospective students, current students, anybody who's part of our community, we're asking to engage tonight. And so we have 75 cities across 25 countries. And so um, one of those cities is Johannesburg. And so we're going to have a reception in Johannesburg. I did the math, right? I think it's 6.30 tonight in Johannesburg. So when you guys are having lunch and, and everything, uh, Today, um, there's going to be a group of, of, of FUQA uh, alums and prospective students and part of the community that are connecting there. So I think the, the nice thing is we're, we're beginning to get an understanding by putting people on the ground there. I think it's, it's equally important and possibly more important to bring people here to, to, to connect. And so, so with that, I, I look at today is going to be a great day. Um, I think you know someone with an outside lens might say it's somewhat ironic that we're looking here, we're here in Durham, North Carolina, to talk about innovation in Africa. But to me, it's really encouraging. So it's not that we're saying we have all this great deep knowledge that we want to project out. We do have some great leaders here with, with insights in Africa. But more that we have the opportunity and the connection and people are willing to come here. We've got this appetite to learn. Um, you know, to connect more, to get a depth of understanding and learn what are the, what are the questions we even need to ask. And for me, um, that's always one of the big things. What do we need to know? What should we be asking? What can we learn? So with that, I want to turn the, the conference back over to, to, to these guys. But thanks, everybody, for being here. I love all the internet uh, of things today, but I love um, the program that they put together. So thank you. Good morning. And welcome to the Fuqua School of Business. My name is Cedric Ngachu. I'm a second year MBA student and I'm the chairman of the Business in Africa conference. Before getting started with the first keynote, I would like to take a couple of minutes to say thank you. Thank you for taking the time and joining us today. Thank you to the 25 speakers coming from Africa, Middle East, and the United States. Thank you to the conference uh, top sponsors, Mochcom Group, IBM, Frontier Oil, the Graduate and Professional Student Council at Duke and Duke Africa Initiative. I also wanted to acknowledge the contribution of Duke MBA Energy, Healthcare, Finance, and Consulting Clubs. And finally, I'm not standing alone in front of you. There's a team of 10 first year and second year MBA students that has been working very hard over the past six months to set up this event. So for that, I think everyone in this room deserves another round of applause. So with that positive vibe, I have the honor to introduce our first keynote, IBM Distinguished Engineer, Chief Technical Officer and Vice President of IBM Middle East and Africa. Please welcome Dr. Nagib Achia. So uh, let me first of all thank you, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here with you. And uh, to, to speak about Africa and the initiatives we are running in Africa and the challenges that you uh, see in Africa. Before I start, I'll tell you, you can hear as much as you can. It will never be as equal as if you are on the ground. Uh, yeah, I'll give you an introduction how I came to this. Uh, I ran for IBM, uh, the industrial sector, as a CTO. Then a year and a half ago, IBM decided to have a CTO for the region. So I went and covered Middle East and Africa. My job was to look at what is needed there in that region. So the first thing you, you do is you just think, OK, I will uh, look at what I did in America and did in uh, other uh, uh, developed country and see how you implement it. And you get that. It doesn't work. So what we've done is I took about a few weeks understanding, meeting, talking, traveling. And then I said, OK, what is missing in Africa is that everything has to be done inside Africa, not to be exported from, right, or imported from. So when we decided that, we found that the most 
and the most critical one, even as an IBM, for us as a company, if we want to grow and if we want to improve our business and if we want to really go and open offices in many countries, first thing I have to do, I have enough skills on the ground. So I looked at countries and we found that the skills is going to be the most challenging area. Not because of anything, it's because the companies over there had their mindset that we need a skill just to ship someone. So I start putting a program for skills. I, the key is you have to have organic growth of skills at each country. Otherwise, you will never succeed with your business plan because you will be shocked with resource scarce, you will be shocked with regulation, you will be shocked with people that you may think they come and live there and they cannot and all of them. So the first key principle was, can we do an organic growth skills within each country? And I would want to start with this map. I want you to see this map. It's shocking that the size of Africa is the total of China, India, US, and half of Europe. So when we say Africa, I want people to just take that word a little bit clearer and understand it is a big continent. You don't say Africa. You say which country in Africa you want to develop because each one. You have English speaking, you have Arabic speaking, you have French speaking. So if you say, I'm going to make an ICT development in Africa, which language? Which culture? Okay. So the first, when you look at that, you have to understand you are dealing with a continent, different countries, different cultures, different rules, different languages. That's the first one. Then you look at the map and the statistics, and they say, Africa is going to be the third one in growth. Then you look at another term and you see 10 out of the 12 countries for growth are from Africa. This is 2014 statistics. So now you step back and say, what am I going to do about this? There is a potential, there is a lot of growth, there is a lot of areas there I can work with, but first of all, what is my understanding of Africa? And that takes time, and that's why I said, you will never understand it if you just think by looking at the map or reading at Google that this is Africa. No, you have to be there. So when we looked at that and we said, what was the first challenge I have to do is, OK, what's IBM's strategy? And the IBM strategy came to be, OK, we already been in Africa for many years. We actually started in the 1940s. But I can tell you, every company, including IBM, till a few years ago, we're thinking of Africa as a sales area. You open a sales office, you bring your product, you open a sales team, and you sell. So most companies thinking there was not about developing Africa, it's about selling in Africa. You, you, you see the difference? If you are there and working in Africa and developing a country, and you are in the country, it's different than you open a sales office and just Everything come by boat or a plane, and you sell it, and you make your profit. That was until, I can say, until 2000-something, when most companies, including IBM, said, no, Africa is going to be different. Africa is going to produce its own products. Africa is going to develop its own technology. Africa is going to have the skills to do in-country activity. So what do you do in that case? We start putting plans. And we start coming. That's why they said, if we bring someone down, we need someone who actually run industries. Run industries, build solutions, build that. And I'll just give you the, a little bit what do we mean IBM industrial sector means. IBM industrial sector is the responsibility of all automotive accounts, all airspace accounts, all electronics accounts, and all petrochemical accounts. So when you say industrial sector, you say the world, right? So they said, OK, you've been doing that for seven years. Come on, flip now. Try to think, what can we do with this industry within Africa and each country? So the first thing I thought, OK, even if I bring buses of people, they're going to be there one or two years maximum. So we put a strategy to line up with the IBM strategy. And the IBM strategy was, look at those 10 areas. Every one of them is, again, a shift on the mind of a company from being a seller office to being 
an engaging company. Like we, not just a sale office, it is an office and research and solution and interaction and building in country and supporting the skills of that. So innovate, local solutions. Because the thing is, yes, you may have the brightest idea. You may have the best idea that can apply here at Duke. When you take it over there, too many things are different. Start from communication, start from power outage, start from people around. Too many things. Are these disadvantaged? I call them challenges. You have to really see it and make it. So when you look at all of this, I start looking at, OK, what do I need to do? I said, OK, let me put a program for skills development. How do you grow a technology in a company, in, in a country? You have to look at a skills. And the skills development started from one kind of a discussion. I said, all right. Uh, I, I, I also, before joining IBM, I am an academic, and I was department chair of computer science, so I know what is needed. I said, let me go to education. Take universities and do a program that's completely different. It's not a company giving you, here it is, come for a week training and you're out. No, I need, I call it job skills. I was in a conference one time and they asked me, I was in charge of UAE, and they asked me, what do you ask governments to do? I said, I asked government to go over each university and say, did you revise your curriculum the past five years? Can you answer that here? How many schools of computer science and engineering and, and, and revised their curriculum in the past five years? Make that a research point. Because I can tell you, across the globe, very few. So we produce students of a curriculum of 20 years old, right? For the generation of today, which is completely mobile, in terms of cloud, in terms of technology analytics, in terms of cognitive computing, where they never heard of it at the university. So the first thing is go to the university and do something. And that do something, I have two options. Either I go and say, Mr. Dean or Mr. Department Chair in this university, sorry to say that, your curriculum sucks. <laughs> or I'll say, I look at your curriculum. Here is what I propose to complement it with skills that enable your students to get a job the day they leave the college. And that was the approach I took, because I was an academic, too. And if you come to a, a, a department chair or a dean and say, let me revise your curriculum. I know it is not working. Let me put my curriculum and say, you are industry. Sorry, don't talk to me. But when I talked to him and I said, I, I proposed the same. I said, are you training your students to what the market is asking for today? Do you deliver a student out of his engineering school that knows floor operation optimization? No. Did they have any intern in a floor manufacturing? Right? No. I'm talking globally, right? So the, the notion is we have to think industry and government and you know, academia to revise what is needed until academia take its cycle and think, OK, I have a curriculum of 20 years. Let me revise it. OK? So that was. So I created a program, and I called it MIA University. And the MIA University was a program, Middle East and Africa University, because I'm all over Middle East and Africa as responsible to take it from Turkey to South Africa. So I said, OK, what are we looking for? We're looking for the new technologies professions. I want someone to graduate and say, I'm a mobile developer, I'm a security manager, or I am a cloud developer, or I am an engineering nose floor machinery optimization and process, or I am a security expert. Now I didn't say I'm a computer science at all. I didn't say I'm an engineer at all. I said I am that profession. So when you come out, so we created the model, we worked the curriculum, and we decided, OK, what is the best way to deliver it? If I deliver it by bringing IBM team, go to your campus, do it for a week, leave, it's one time only. So we thought, OK, why don't we do it this way? Why don't we take the faculty of a university, train them, 
provide them with the latest technology through cloud and portals, so they have 24-hour access to the material we created, build them, and I'll tell you, as I've said, everyone will say, hey, yeah, deliver it through a cloud is an e-learning. Good luck to you in a village in Nigeria or Kenya. It's not 24-hour connectivity, it's not 24-hour power. So how do we avoid that? As I said, it's a challenge. We created what I call university cloud. I build a small cloud, put all the material on it at a campus to cover the university, which a university normally have a backup, power backup, and the communication within the university is easier than between a city and a city. With that, we went to the university presidents, and I met with them. And I said, here's my proposal, here's what I create, crafted for you, 10 areas of expertise. I will start with the first four, business analytics, data management, security, and mobility, mobile uh, technology. Africa is ahead of many countries, I call it, many countries in Africa, I don't say Africa anymore. Many countries in Africa are ahead of many other developed countries in mobile use and a phone. Kenya is the leading now on mobile banking. They do everything in a phone ahead of many developed countries. So by understanding the restrictions, by understanding the, 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 I call it the boundaries, I created a solution that fits locally at a university. I provide the training, I train the faculty. Then I said, okay, if I get you out as a training, it's not as good as if you say I'm a certified. There is a difference when you say I attended a workshop for a week or a difference to say, I am a certified security manager. I am a certified data management expert, right? So what we did is we created the curriculum with certification process. And I, as I mentioned, we went all over the world. I created a portal for it. So every student on all countries is registered. I followed their pattern of exercise. I give them access 24-7, and I see when they take the test, and I give them free test material, so I prepare them. Remember, we're coming into very green field, as we call it, new ground. So if you just say, I know that we can do e-learning, give me what I did in Stanford, take this bag, go with the trip, have five students, Mr. University, here it is. Before a week, you will be done. You will be shocked because you are not prepared to understand the environment. So the advice I give to everyone here who wants to deal with Africa, make a trip. Understand the environment first. So with this program, we started last year. I actually installed it in 18 universities in Africa. Succeeded. I was two weeks ago in Kenya where we have our first certified group of students at Jomo Kenyatta University. 170 students graduated like this. Certification rate, 94%. I can give it here at Duke, and I can get certification rate maybe 30 to 40. Let me be honest. It's not because of anything, because someone will take it casually. Over there, they know it is a lifeline. You gave me certification, you give me a chance, I can find a job tomorrow. So because of that, because of the seriousness, because of the lifeline, the students are taking it very serious in addition to their classroom. When I attended their graduation ceremony, it was um, March 6th, you can tell it was like a, a, a chapel. It was like a ch everyone is listening, everyone is interested, everyone is proud that they got certified, everyone was actually talking about the next thing. You know what the next thing is? Africa has, a, all countries over years, a kind of a dilemma that I graduated, the government will find me a job. Middle East and Africa mindset is that for years and years. We're trying to change that. I said, don't depend on the government. That's a poverty job. Think what you do. I have a third year students want to be an entrepreneur with the students with him to develop mobile applications. So my second thing to them, I said, be free. Learn it, think, be an entrepreneur. Because that's what will develop the countries in Africa. 
What will develop countries in Africa is not to get graduates out of college. There are a lot of graduates out of college in each country by millions, 23 to 30 percent unemployed. So it's not about the college degree. It's about what skill did you give me? What kind of initiative did you help me with so I can be my own? And that's what Africa is going to develop. When Africa starts being entrepreneur, I was in that meeting and I gave the speech to students and I said, I want you to understand, because of the technology in your hand and because of your develop, develop something and send it to someone in Silicon Valley. If they like it, they will take a flight and come here and sign a contract with you. Don't think you are developing only local. You are global now. So that's the mindset. That's what we did with this. So what is the next step? You say, OK, outstanding, all of this. I got last year, I trained 1,800 students. I got my first. This is started April 14, by the way. I got all this, so we have to prepare. You have to put the cloud. You have to send people to set it. And we start getting. It's like building a new college, right? And then here it is. I went to a, co a conference called Innovative Africa in Rwanda in November. And I met with some ministers. And each one of them, when we discussed, he said, why did you go to my country before coming to me? I said, all right, next meeting is you. So I started doing something second level. As I tell you, sometimes you don't intend to be that successful, but sometimes it happens naturally. There is countries in Africa have what they call National Research Network Group. Kenya, South Africa, Rwanda, uh, Nigeria, Morocco, Tunisia, Egypt. So now I said, wow. And instead of me going into Kenya, which I already have about eight universities and all that, I will go on level up, the Ministry of Education in Kenya, then the research network, and I will put all my data and all my training at them, and they funnel it to the whole countries. By this week, we signed five countries. So what's happening is that you find they are eager, they want your help, but make it true help. Really true help, not just a kind of visit for a picture. Because they, they've experienced that enough. You come, a good delegate, a good visit, a good picture, a shake hand, goodbye, nothing happened. They needed to see it happening. So when we start doing that with them, I start getting, now I used to go to a president of a university and convince them. I remember my first visit to Jomo Kenyatta University, I said, the dean said, you are actually telling me what a student just a week ago in his graduation asked me for. He said, I'm graduating, I don't know what to do. After I explained to him the profession and the profession, I have the whole details of what the profession, where the profession is, stands in the world, how much salary you can get if you work, what kind of skills. The dean said, I need to implement it now. So now I get from being convincing a president and a dean, now the ministers are calling and saying, send your guys here, make a presentation sign. And you will see some of those. So this was the first initiative, which I call it the long-term strategic, right? Because how long will it take me to graduate enough masses to cover the country? Two, three, four years, wonderful. But what about now? What about now? So for about now, I met with uh, uh, many industry leaders. And uh, uh, what we decided is, if you look at this material, this material is crafted as a re really a degree. 120 hours, 80% hands-on. First 20 hours, when I designed it, I said, do you think English major and history major cannot write a code? Some say, I said, sometimes they write better than a computer scientist. So what do you need to do? I said, OK, here's what we need to do. 20 hours at the beginning, plus additional material to read to get you to this subject. If you are willing, you will become master of the entry to the subject. If you are not willing, I, I, I can't do anything for you, right? So the first 20 hours, I will teach you what this subject is about. Mobility, security, cloud. Then I take you for a 40 hours of a track to master that level. 
Then, for example, you develop mobile applications. You develop it. But if you implement it at a bank, the bank needs someone to run it and maintain it and understand it. I give another four hours of managing what you developed. So now is good. But we are in a world that doesn't have silos anymore. If you develop application in mobile, I'll tell you what you've done already. You open a hole in security. You created big data mass because you're did 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 like that, right? And you do not really know how to link this data to the bank you're deploying at or whatever. So there is no data management. So you did something, but you didn't know what you already have done. So what I want you to understand is, are you developing it with security in mind? So I have to give you an idea. What happened to you? Are you developing it to understand that you are going to deploy it on a cloud? What kind of cloud standard that will live in? Are you deploying it understanding that the metadata that will come out of it, you have to do some analytics over it, otherwise you're wasting the energy and the value? So I give them another 20 hours of what is happening, of what you are studying to the rest of the world. They come out of that. I, I, I'm not saying I'm giving them a master degree, but I'm giving them enough foundation and a link to IBM library called Redbooks. I think we should offer that to you and it's an access. The IBM Library Red Books is a library of the books that are written by the people who develop and innovate the thing. So if it is a topic, that red book about that topic is written by the guy who developed or innovated that thing. And that's a library that's not out in the public. That's we give it to university access. I gave it to them. So I said, I am giving you the first step. And I tell them this. You remember I started by the curriculum, right? Every five years. I said, you have to develop yourself every year. Don't think you're just done now. No, this is for this year. Next year, new things will come. If you don't update yourself, if you don't follow, don't come and blame me, right? It is you now. So they start understanding, they start living the technology. That was the model. So what I did is I took that model I compress it to 40 hours, and I gave it to companies. And I said, you have technical people already working. The CIO office, the technical companies that they run, our business partners, our clients. I said, OK, I'm going to run 12 events every year, one a month in one different country, Tanzania. Uh, today, actually, they are in Cape Town, South Africa. I was last week in South Africa, Joburg. So what we do is we take that thing, because I'm receiving a worker. At least if I give them a read before they know, I can go faster. And I take them into a 40-hour compressed five days, set in a room like a total, total compressed 40 hours. They came out. So I'll tell you, I was someone, and I know someone from them said, so what is in it for you, IBM? I'm thinking this is in your head already, <laughs> all right? I know it's going to happen. I said, let me tell you. Strategically, when I educate those students, I know I have a, a list of people I can pull from when I need to hire. And I know they know my technology. And I know where they are at because I tested them and I certified them. So the students coming out will be my best pool for hiring. OK, so what about the business partners and the sales and the people? I said. Simply put, if you are my business partner and you are selling my solution or my product and you are not that qualified, what's going to happen? You sign the deal, you take the check, you go. Whenever it happens, oh, call IBM 800. So I get millions of 800 calls, right? By me educating you, by me enabling you, by me empowering you, that 8 million, 100, 800 calls will go to a minimum, right? I will have a better reputation, I will have a better service in the country because I trained you. So I invest. We are investing big money. This thing costs millions to run every year. But I'm running it because my strategy go back to the statement I mentioned. Unless I have an organic growth and skills in each country, my strategy for expansion will not succeed. So I'm doing it for big strategy. I'm doing it for the skills. I'm doing it for my product now. I minimize customer complaints. I got my business partners are enabled. 
I got people who deal with my solutions like what I'm already giving them, which is part of your service. You don't just provide it and go. You remember as mentioned, it's not about check hand and go. So now I leave behind in each country, I leave technically skilled people already trained. I have a long strategy with colleges and students. You know what's my number expected in two years? 40,000. You know what I got that number? I'll give you a number. When I was at that innovation conference, I met with the president of the Tunisian Virtual University. It took 10 minutes. Believe me, I didn't even open my computer to explain that. And he agreed, and we signed the contract about three weeks ago. His number of students that I will have access to to train, 350,000 students, French speaking. If I train those, I covered Tunisia, Algeria, Morocco, all French-speaking countries. I have a, a troop, one national decision I made with the country. I can get over 100,000 students once I sign with South Africa National Research uh, Network. So now you can see how I scale. And instead of going to university and get 300 every semester or every year, I got the country for 350,000. It takes me maybe twice the effort of one university. So that is the strategy. So what we did is we created all of this program. We managed it. We started deploying it. I have to take that out. And here are some pictures. This is the president of the uh, Virtual University of Tunisia. And that's when we signed with him very recently. That's the team that works with me. The next slide is the most fascinating. Uh, uh, that's uh, Nick Nesbitt. Uh, fascinating story. Because that's the Minister of Rwanda. Ministry of Rwanda, Minister of Education. This gentleman. When we sat with him in November, and I described that to him, he said, don't waste your time. Just come to me. I want you to send your people to describe it. And, but let me tell you one thing. I said, what? He said, my president loved technology. And if I go and tell him that I'm going to work with IBM and it doesn't happen, it will be bad for IBM. I said, I promise you, we are serious. So that was November. January, my team was there giving the material presentation. March, we were signing, you see? And the media and all of that was there. He couldn't believe. I said, when we promise, we deliver. So we are not. This is part of our strategy. Well, let me tell you, when I was there, I discovered there is a Carnegie Mellon campus in Rwanda. So the dean of Carnegie Mellon was sitting. And he said, how can I work with you, Nagib? I like your program. I love it. He said, OK. I said, let's meet. We met in his office an hour later after this event. He said, you are running my master's degree program that I'm trying to do what I developed at the towers, because I told you, what are the areas of new technologies? He was trying to run the new technologies and building a master degree. Now the master degree curriculum is in his hand. So we partnered together. So how do I leverage him? I leverage him to make him my pool of an instructor's generator. He's master's and PhD. If I train them, they become my pool. And instead of me sending team to Rwanda after a team until we get the enough power, I will train him, train all the students. They go back to their villages and countries and become my instructors. And by the way, I pay them, not volunteering. When you get volunteer, you may survive a year. You need to be serious, it has to be business. So I pay them as a, I'm sending an instructor. But better for me, because I save the hotel, I save the flight. And also, I know they're always there. So that's the signature with the Minister of Rwanda. And you can even uh, uh, Google it and find it, the IBM Rwanda uh, uh, MIA University program signing. Uh, this is the uh, Mount Kenya University signing the MOU. And uh, uh, this, this was uh, I, 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 an experience I cannot forget. We were in a room with about 250 students, as I mentioned. They were like, this is, this is, I taught in the US, I taught in the Middle East, I taught. This was a different experience. 
really as if you are sitting in a chapel. Lecture after lecture, commitment, and no phone, no iPhone, no, no what we are always doing, right? Serious. And you look around and you say, yes, I would work with you. I would love to have hundreds of you, right? So that's with the uh, Kenya University. And uh, this is another, look at that. I, I just want to put that so you, you see the seriousness, right? Look at the picture. Truly setting, thinking, listening, involved. So the next thing I designed is, OK, for the technical teams from the companies, what are we going to do? As I mentioned, I put a plan. And these are the countries I already executing. Every country I go there, I train about 100 to 150. If I repeat it four or five times, I think I'll have enough uh, uh, momentum that in the country they already know the skills and they know the things. And I will tell you, in all of these people, uh, countries, uh, uh, some people say, how do you go to this or that risk and, and the danger and all what we hear? There's no different than downtown Manhattan. There's no different. It is a risk as a normal risk in any country. Yes, it can happen. Uh, the mall happens in Kenya. I was there two weeks, two days after the mall happy, uh, event happened in that. But you get shooting in our movies theater here, too. All right? You get, so, so you take that fear out. Be careful. Deliver. Be in the right responsible areas. Because the more, here's what I say to them. The more we insist we are not going to be afraid, and we're going to do it, and we're going to educate, and we're going to train, the more we're better. Because the minute we hide and we're afraid, they are the master of the street. So education, training, skills, entrepreneurship, give you a chance to do your own work, give you a chance to earn your own income, is the way for each country. So with that program, we created that. We said, OK, what is next? And I need to be sure that I don't miss my uh, time, because I normally get into this. This is one uh, very close to my heart. These are the pictures of the people when we were giving them the, you can see age different groups from companies leaving their work, coming for five days to learn. Because where can you get that? Where can you get that? Someone is coming and saying, I will work with you. I will make you better. And let's work together so we can. And as I go back again, it is because we change our strategy. We are not a sales office. We are as if we are running in New York. Solutions, innovations, latest technology. What can we do for you? So you will le learn a lot more about what can we do for you from my friend Yui here when he talks about research. But we solve national initiatives. I had a lot of meetings uh, uh, with uh, uh, ministers and all that. I give you uh, one of them. I was sitting and we were talking. And that happens in Kenya after the mall of two days and then. And I just through the discussion, that event came to the discussion. I said, but that could have been prevented if we did one and two and three and four, which IBM can help you with in this. Then I went to my research team, and I was there one day, and I said, we really need to help in that area. I didn't know that that minister almost like recording what I told him and all the things. I got a call. I was in my car going to the airport on a Wednesday. And they said they want to come down and see it. I said, OK. I am actually, because my schedule is like, I'm almost an hour from the airport. Why don't you go and meet Dr. Kamel, who's the U.S. boss? I already explained to him, and I already explained. Three days later, the two were engaged, and we worked with them. I don't want to tell you that they prevented many other mall attacks. So this is what I go and say. I say to the minister, I'm not here to tell you that IBM hardware is good. I am here because as my CTO, as a CTO, I didn't run that. I said, what is your challenge? I remember one of them joked with me. I said, I said really, yes. What is your country challenge or a dream? I said, oh, you American rude again. You are going to tell me what to do. I said, no, believe me. I'm telling you, tell me what's your dream, and I'll work with you on it. And they start believing. Because what uh, if, you, if you look at IBM and you look what, what we have, uh, I, I, it will take you years to understand the areas that we are involved in. The research, 
the development, the creation of human uh, uh, being, problem solving. We solve water problems, we solve genetics problems, we solve security problems, we solve industry problems, we solve many, many things. We solve oil problems, aerospace, I, have, I can tell you stories and stories. So because we are in that domain, the people who are living in that know what we do. So I told him, let's work with you. So the last thing after that was countries that I meet with, they start saying, OK, what can we do? We also did another thing. We said, all right, how many PhDs from your country are studying abroad? Tell me about your people. They said, OK. I said, I would love, after we train them and they have finished their degree abroad, to take them into an IBM program called Leading to Africa, Diaspora. We will train them for a summer. I give them a stipend for 10 weeks. Live in IBM lab, work next to a researcher, live, live the IBM experience for, a ten, for 10 weeks. And that's a program that Don is leading with me. And when we train them that, we, we know that you are from this country, and we try to get from you. Are you willing to go back and work in that country, either for IBM or another company? My goal is to see you back there helping your own company or country. So we got some of them. That program also is in progress. We get every year about, we already have some candidates from here. Right. And that program is reducing the students. Uh, also that we train them and send them back to the countries. The next thing is we do a PhD fellowship. We offer the PhDs, graduates who want to work inside IBM, get a fellowship, learn more, get hands-on experience industrial, really immerse in real true programs, and go back work in their field. The second one after that is we give research grants. We have a competition globally every year. We receive research requests, and we provide grants. And we provide hardware grants, and we provide uh, that uh, sure university research, and we provide collaboration research. All of these are programs that have been established that are available too, and we can leave the net uh, link to all of you to compete and be there. Uh, as you can see, the last thing I'm going to mention here is what we do now more, is we call it center of competence. Excellence, center of excellence is, is a, another dimension that we start building with countries. So some countries say, I need to have business analytics center of excellence. I had, uh, all of you have heard about that, the Dubai ruler one morning woke up and said, I need Dubai to be the smartest city in the world. It happened. Former committee has solutions, have ideas. I live there now because of easy. I never go to any place to pay a bill, all here. So, because I'm on a plane. So it doesn't matter, so he's moving. We are with them, built at the American University of Dubai, a center of excellence for smarter cities, where we look at traffic digestion, we look at patterns, we look at improving life, water supply, water distillation, cost of energy, all of this, how to get involved. You are the best selected group of people to think, either to do something for Africa or something inside Africa, or from here, because it doesn't matter, you can make a trip for a few weeks, and then, and then you get engaged with someone, and from here you make that pipe. The world now is, is the one piece. So it doesn't matter if you are going to live there, but are you thinking of their problems? The last thing I had, I'll finish in five minutes, is when I met with the Ministry of Rwanda and the team, they start saying, what can you help us with? So we discussed. You know what was there? Simple. Even the f food supply chain, as simple as that. The food supply chain has a waste of 50% before it reaches the consumer. And the US is maybe 10, 15. So you're wasting 50% of your goods, first thing. Then I chatted with the guy and said, do you know that the guys in Florida that created the orange juice, not because they love to give you juice, it's because there's a lot of oranges that will go rotten. So let's make an orange juice, scan it, and make. And then another one said, ah, oh, yeah, that's why the guys in California made the almond milk. I said, yes. You have to manufacture. 
there is access, there is timing, there is different timing of product versus consumption. There is all of that thinking, which is the supply chain model, right? Anyone can look at any of these countries and look back and say, I can handle one problem, produce manufacturing from farm to user. From. I'll give you a last thing to close with. It's a very nice teenage girl, entrepreneur in Kenya, high school. She lives in a village. She was in an economist one day. Lives in a village, and she realized that her family and farmers take their goods to the market, and they don't get the fair price. Mobile, I told you all, everyone has a phone. She created a same chat team together. She chatted with the market guys the night before. Understand the value of the produce, pass it to the farmers who are going to the market next morning, and that's the price they demand. That's a stock market mindset, right? She made a group, she opened a company, and she's one of the successful entrepreneurs in Kenya. With that, thank you very much. Any questions? I'm going to have this. Given the quarterly earnings mindset of most big US companies, how is IBM able to support something which is clearly so long term in, in orientation? How did that decision happen? Does the support go all the way up to the board? And how can you take that enlightenment and share it with other companies who don't see it? It's a hard sell, but I convinced uh, with the executive team that. If you put a strategy and you don't have the manpower, it's like you go to war and you don't have troops. <laughs> so it is a virtual war. So they were convinced that the money they put now, they're going to get it. Because I tell you, if you have a list of 100 candidates to recruit from, that covers the cost. Because for me to spend to make a recruitment for 10 people or 15 people is a lot of money. If I know them, if I already engage with them and recruit. So I convinced them that if you, if you have a strategy and don't have the manpower, the troops coming down the road, forget it. If this will save you money on your, uh, on your uh, uh, recruitment uh, process, this will also save you money in your marketing, because I'm doing more than marketing. I'm doing real, real feel and touch. So I took piece from this budget, budget convinced them. And when they start seeing the result and they start seeing the minister is putting us in the whole country, the, all that, they, they were convinced that this is something uh, they need to support. Um, first of all, I want to thank you and commend you for your initiatives. Um, I just wanted to know, is there a particular criteria that a country has to meet? Because um, I noticed for the East African countries, um, uh, Rwanda and Kenya are uh, technologically Tanzania. progressive compared to Uganda, where I'm from. So what I want to know is, is there, do you have to first establish a need or do the leaders have to reach out to you uh, what's the entire process? Because I, I so think it's a really right. good idea. In, in April last year when I started, I started with the country that we have offices on first, so I can get easy setting. I know people. I know where to get the things. You can see in my list this year I extended. Uh, there are some countries who are we are not yet tapping because, call it market studies, analytic analysis, about do we have a need there yet? But my goal is, I think it's 54 countries in the whole country, is to finish them in three years. Yeah. So I've been, I've been to Nigeria many times. You can see Tanzania many times, Egypt two, three times. Uh, let me say this. The mass of knowledge in the whole continent is like distributed really nice. You get a lot of universities in the right corner, top right corner of Egypt. You got a lot of universities, Algeria, and Morocco. I, I call it a lot and also history. 100 years is 110. So you get enough types of PhDs, enough type, the things that already have history. Then you go a little bit down, and you get Kenya, surrounding by Tanzania and Ethiopia, the corner, and Rwanda coming. 
and then you go in the other west and you get the kind of Nigeria and the surrounding. Then you go down and in South Africa. So South Africa, if I do a lot of work, I will go up a little bit, take the two, come down, and then. I have bigger plans. I'm actually, I have a plan to have the whole continent connected. There are two here, so okay. Yeah, no, no, go ahead. Oh, okay. If you can please elaborate um, one more time, because I've, I've listened to the presentation and I see your passion to want to expand uh, to the rest of the continent. And I kind of had the same question because I'm also from Uganda and I was wondering why you're not there. Um, it's in the list of this year. Huh? I <laughs> was looking for it. But more of, I, I really wanted to see what are you seeing in what opportunities are you looking to maximize in the future on the continent to put this much effort um, into training um, technicians, salespeople, et cetera, for your company? What is your company looking to reap from um, all of this investment? What are you seeing? So I go back to that, our strategy, as you've seen, innovation, skills, solutions locally and the countries. If I want to do a, as I mentioned, solve that supply chain for Rwanda, right? And the farming, whatever. Is it easy for me to bring 10 supply chain experts from US or I have them in Rwanda already? As IBMers, not as a, you know what I mean? So for me to grow, for me to be, transform myself from a sales office to a true company developing, solving, engaging, I have to get that. So you can see we have the, the, the thinking of two to three years down the road. So when I get engaged now, I'm not afraid to say, because I give you, you're all business people, right? If I go and make a project in a country and all I'm having people are flying from Europe and US, that project will cost three times the value. And it will be overpriced and it will be hard. If I have the people on the ground, that cost of that project would be really optimal. So think long term. Think five years from now. If, if you want to have a business, true business, not the sales office, true business, you need to have the experts on the ground. So that's where we started. I think you were raising your hand many times. Yes. Very quickly. So there are two sides to the coin. And what you're hearing this morning right, is our effort uh, on skills development. But it's a corporate strategy. Africa is strategic and critical for IBM. And later this afternoon at about 4.30, I'll give the other side of the coin that will answer your question. How are we creating an ecosystem to motivate the entrepreneurial spirit that you have in Africa with the underpinning of technology? But that will be for later. So I said well, he's going to cover the research and innovation side. Ever I, I took that. Yes, you have a, you raise your hand a couple of times. Yes. Hi, how are you? Yes, I'm Doing good, thank you. I'm doing fine, yes. Um, I'm from here, but I'm African descent and all that stuff. Engineer, 27 years at GA and all that stuff. And uh, in terms of power, you know what I'm saying, uh, how are you surviving with this thing since there's a shortage of power in Africa? How are you surviving with this thing? All right, so what we did, as you remember I mentioned, I'm, I built a university cloud. Mm -hmm. So. The hours that they have, they, they have, by the way, regular hours to shut down power. There is a lot of things we don't experience here. Imagine that between four and six is every day is off, and this hour is off. And the, so they, first of all, the people that live in that country are adapted and they understand it, that there's these two hours of no power. But the rest of the day, I'm available. And because I'm available technologically and during the time for power, so all we need for them is communication and power. They are trying to improve the power uh, grid in these countries, but it is a lot of investment and it's a long term. Okay, one other question, sir. Does this, this has to be in terms of IT? IBM does invest in IT only, or do they invest in other stuff? Like, you know, if as an engineer myself, I've designed something that, you know, I want you, uh, as a labor, labor for Africa, we're having power issues yes. to train our uh, own African people right. how to run power stations. Can IBM invest on that too? 
We are. We are. I was just going to say, we are. We are when, when IBM think of Africa, I, I, I just didn't want to cover, as I mentioned, I can be here days. I took the skills and strategy that I have. You we will give you the development and innovation strategy that we have. I can bring you another one that will tell you the marketing strategy that we have. So we are not just about the IT, as I mentioned. We are not a sales office anymore. We are a solution provider company. So power solutions, traffic solutions, supply chain solutions, food, water, all of that. Yes, you, you, I don't know how much time. You tell me. OK. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. Done? Oh. It's up to you. You tell me. <laughs> OK. Yeah, excellent, excellent presentation. I love that. Um, one of the things I was thinking about, are you sharing best practices as well within the African you know, countries? Because one of the things um, what Kenya is doing to replicate it in other African countries rather than going with a um, uh, Western you know, solution because the countries are yeah. you know, similar with some traditional differences, but on the whole, they have similar problems. We run seminars. We run workshops. So uh, remember, uh, I, I, we deal with different segments, right? So when I deal with universities and education models and education systems, we give them the best practice for that kind of a model. When you deal with research and when you deal with innovation, you give them press tracks like that. When our consultants are in the ground, they tell them about their experience and what they've done. So it is available. Uh, we publish it too. Yes. Uh, thanks for the work you're doing. Uh, just curious if you could speak a bit to the gender breakdown in your training programs and any initiatives to get uh, more female representation in ICT. Let me tell you, you'll be surprised. The female-male ratio in Africa is not as we think is here. In universities, female are more than males. And, 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 and let me call it this. And seriousness of education, females are more than males. So I haven't seen it. What I do is I go to university and say, give me a class, and here the class. I never made any kind of, it, it, it's already there, it's balanced. Yeah, thank you for the question. Yes. Yes, it's you, yes. So thank you, thank you for coming to present to us really mind-blowing information. Uh, my question is, I hear a lot of positive things, and as people interested in Africa, Grown up, born and grown up there, and left a couple of years ago. I want to understand what are the challenges you face as you've been doing this program? What are some of the biggest challenges you all see at your spanning job? Do you want the challenges from a personal <laughs> side of you or from everything? Uh, let me say this uh, you, you travel, so you face the challenges of travel. You go across immigration, you change, you face that. So let's look at these things as take them with a, 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 a spirit of fun, right? But if the country is willing to help and the country is waiting for you to support, all this you will forget. Uh, you have to be uh, uh, careful. Like, for example, uh, if you have a taxi taking you from an airport to the hotel, take that taxi. If you stay in that hotel and they say, don't walk after dark, don't walk after dark. Uh, just the normal thing that you follow. But uh, I, I haven't seen like a pushback or a resistance or uh, that, no. Yes. Thank you for your presentation. Um, what I was going to ask is, I like the way that IBM wants to work with to solve problems versus telling people what to do. And I think that's one thing that will make you successful in Africa. You. Um, the other question I have is, regarding these skills that you, you're getting on board, do you have a path for them to sustain them and grow them? Um, I saw some of the PhD programs where you have mentors. Are you encouraging that, you know, that growth I, uh, I, so I that there's longevity <laughs> in this? Because it's a good thing. I, I love your question because this is exactly what I started getting from the ministers. And I said, guys, do you think I'll open a university then? 
because I need like you're asking me for alumni office for <laughs> for a follow up database for so it is growing and we are paying attention to that. I actually got uh, as I mentioned, you know, I was working with few universities. My goal was few universities. Now I work with countries. So my database is growing, so I put a model that we will analyze, we will know. I have to know the people certified, and I follow them. Uh, the mentoring thing, what I try to do is to get them from within. The professors, they, I, I want them to be one community. I don't want them to depend on me and my team, because we will be few in a, few, in a year or two. We will be very uh, small compared to the growth. And then, then I want, whenever I, I want like this, I, I, I plant a seed and I put a tree, I want that tree to grow within the country and become the, the tree for the country. I help, I continue to help, I provide technology. I provided this SUR, the grants, I provided about $400,000 of hardware last year. I gave it to them. Because uh, you said, Yes, they have hard time for power. They have, how do you build a cloud? I said, look, I am bringing it. I will put the cloud. I got the guy and the team to go and deploy it for you. All I have from you is to maintain it after I leave. So we understand. We are, we are. And it's going to grow. I know it's going to, to, to grow faster than me. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, and uh, this is it. Thank you very much. Pleasure being with you.